Chapter 2 The First Whiff of Revolution Dismayed by the hopeless length of my sentence, stunned by my first acquaintance with the world of Gulag, I could never have believed at the beginning of my time there that my spirit would recover by degrees from its dejection, that as the years went by I should ascend, so gradually that I was hardly aware of it myself, to an invisible peak of the archipelago, as though it were Mauna Loa on Hawaii, and from there gaze serenely over distant islands and even feel the lure of the treacherous, shimmering sea between. The middle part of my sentence I served on a golden isle, where prisoners were given enough to eat and drink, and kept warm and clean. In return for all this, not much was required of me, just twelve hours a day sitting at a desk and making myself agreeable to the bosses. But clinging to these good things suddenly became distasteful. I was groping for some new way to make sense of prison life. Looking around me, I realized now how contemptible was the advice of the special assignment prisoner from Krasnaya Preznia. At all costs, steer clear of general duties. The price we were paying seemed disproportionately high. Prison released in me the ability to write, and I now gave all my time to this passion brazenly neglecting my boring office work. There was something I had come to value more than the butter and sugar they gave me, standing on my own feet again. Well, they jerked a few of us to our feet, en route to a special camp. They took a long time getting us there, three months. It could be done more quickly with horses in the 19th century. So long that this journey became, as it were, a distinct period in my life, and it even seems to me that my character and outlook changed in the course of it. The journey was bracing, cheerful, full of good omens. A freshening breeze buffeted our faces, the wind of Katorga and of freedom. People and incidents pressed in on every hand to assure us that justice was on our side, on our side, on our side, not with our judges and jailers. The Butirki, our old home greeted us with a heart-rending female shriek from a window, probably that of a solitary confinement cell. Help! Save me! They're killing me! They're killing me! Then the cries were choked in a warder's hands. At the Butirki station, we were mixed up with raw recruits of the 1949 intake. They all had funny sentences, not the usual tenors, but quarters. When at each of the numerous roll calls they had to give dates of release, it sounded like a cruel joke. October 1974! February 1975! No one surely could sit out such a sentence. A man must get hold of some pliers and cut the wire. These twenty-five-year sentences were enough to transform the prisoner's world. The holders of power had bombarded us with all they had. Now it was the prisoner's turn to speak, to speak freely, uninhibitedly, Undeterred by threats, the words we had never heard in our lives and which alone could enlighten and unite us. We were sitting in a Stolypin car at the Kazan station when we heard from the station loudspeaker that war had broken out in Korea. After penetrating a firm South Korean defense line to a depth of ten kilometers on the very first day, the North Koreans insisted that they had been attacked. Any imbecile who had been at the front understood that the aggressors were those who had advanced on the first day. This war in Korea excited us even more. In our rebellious mood, we longed for the storm. The storm must break, it must, it must, or else we were doomed to a lingering death. Somewhere past Ryazan, the red rays of the rising sun struck with such force through the mole's eye windows of the prison car that the young guard in the corridor near our grating screwed up his eyes. Our guards might have been worse. They had crammed us into compartments fifteen or so at a time. They fed us on herring. But to be fair, they also brought us water and let us out morning and evening to relieve ourselves, so that we should have had no quarrel with them if this lad hadn't unthinkingly, not maliciously, tossed the words enemies of the people at us. That started it. Our compartment and the next pitched into him. All right, we're enemies of the people, but why is there no grub on the Kolkots? You're a country boy yourself by the look of you, but I bet you'll sign on again. I bet you'd sooner be a dog on a chain than go back to the plough. If we're enemies of the people, why paint the prison bands different colours? Who are you hiding us from? 
Listen, kid, I had two like you who never came back from the war, and you call me an enemy of the people? It was a very long time since words like this had flown through the bars of our cages. We shouted only the plainest of facts, too self-evident to be refuted. A sergeant, serving extra time, came to the aid of the flustered youngster, but instead of hauling anyone off to the cooler or taking names, he tried to help his subordinate to fight back. Here, too, we saw a faint hint that times were changing. No, this was 1950, too soon to speak of better times. What we saw were signs of the new relationship between prisoners and jailers created by the new long sentences and the new political camps. Our argument began to take on the character of a genuine debate. The young men took a good look at us and could no longer bring themselves to call us or those in the next compartment enemies of the people. They tried trotting out bits from newspapers and from their elementary politics course, but their ears told them before their minds could that these set phrases rang false. Look for yourselves, lads. Look out the window, was the answer they got from us. Look what you've brought Russia down to. Beyond the windows stretched a beggarly land of rotted thatch and rickety huts and ragged folk. We were on the Rutsayev line by which foreigners never travel. If the Golden Horde had seen it so befouled, they would not have bothered to conquer it. On the quiet station at Torbeyevo, an old man walked along the platform in bast shoes. An old peasant woman stopped opposite the lowered window of our car and stood rooted to the spot for a long time, staring through the outer and inner bars at us prisoners tightly packed together on the top bed shelf. She stared at us with that look on her face which our people have kept for unfortunates throughout the ages. A few tears trickled down her cheeks. She stood there, work coarsened and shabby, and she looked at us as though a son of hers lay among us. You mustn't look in there, Mama, the guard told her, but not roughly. She didn't even turn her head. At her side stood a little girl of ten with white ribbons in her plaits. She looked at us very seriously with a sadness strange in one of her years, her little eyes wide and unblinking. She looked at us so hard that she must have imprinted us on her memory forever. As the train eased forward, the old woman raised her blackened fingers and devoutly, unhurriedly, made the sign of the cross over us. Then at another station, some girl in a spotted frock, anything but shy or timid, came right up to our window and started boldly asking us what we were in for and for how long. Get away, bellowed the guard who was pacing the platform. Why? What will you do? I'm the same as them. Here's a pack of cigarettes. Give it to the lads. And she produced them from her handbag. We had already realized that the girl had done time. So many of them, now roaming around free, had received their training on the archipelago. The deputy guard commander jumped out of the train. Get away, I'll put you inside. She stared scornfully at the old sweat's ugly mug. You go and... Yourself, you... Give it to them, lads she said to encourage us, and made a dignified departure. So we rode on, and I don't think the guards felt that they were protecting the people from its enemies. On we went, more and more inflamed with the conviction that we were right, that all Russia was with us, that the time was at hand to abolish this institution. At the Kwebyshev Transit Prison, where we sunbathed, that is, loafed, for more than a month, more workers came our way. The air was suddenly rent by the sickening, hysterical yells of thieves. They even whine in a loathsome, shrill way. Help! Get us out of here! The fascists are beating us! Fascists! Here was something new. Fascists beating thieves? It always used to be the other way around. But shortly after, there was a reshuffle of prisoners, and we found that no miracles had happened yet. It was only the first swallow, Pavel Boronyuk. His chest was a millstone. His gnarled hands were ever ready for a friendly clasp or a blow. He was dark in complexion, aquiline, more like a Georgian than a Ukrainian. He had been an officer at the front, had prevailed in a machine-gun duel with three Messerschmitts, had been recommended for the order of Hero of the Soviet Union and turned down by the special section, 
had been sent to a punitive battalion and returned with a decoration. And now he had a tenor, which as times now were, was hardly a man's sentence. He had sized up the thieves while he was still on his way from the jail at Novograd Polinsk, and had fought with them before. Now he was sitting in the next cell on the upper bed platform, quietly playing chess. The whole cell were fifty-eights, but the administration had slipped two thieves in among them. On his way to clear his rightful sleeping space by the window, a Bellamore cigarette dangling carelessly from his lip, Fixati said jokingly, Might have known they'd put me with gangsters again. The naive Veliev, who didn't know much about thieves, hastened to reassure him. No, we're all fifty-eights here. What about you? I'm an embezzler. I'm an educated man. The thieves chased two men away, slung their own sacks onto their reserved places, and walked through the cell examining other people's sacks and looking for trouble. The fifty-eights, no, they hadn't changed yet. They put up no resistance. Sixty grown men waited tamely for their turn to be robbed. There is something hypnotically disarming about the impudence of thieves who never for a moment expect to meet resistance. Besides, they can always count on the support of authority. Boronyuk went on pretending to move his chessmen, but by now he was rolling his eyes in fury and wondering how best to take care of them. When one of the thieves stopped in front of him, he swung his dangling foot and booted him in his ugly face, then jumped down, grabbed the stout wooden lid of the sanitary bucket and brought it down in a stunning blow on the other thief's head. Then he began hitting them alternately with the lid until it fell to pieces, leaving its base, two solid bars joined crosswise in his hands. The thieves changed their tune to a pathetic whine, but it must be admitted that there was a certain humour in their moans that they seemed to see the funny side of it. What do you think you're doing? Hitting people with a cross. Just because you're strong, you shouldn't bully others. Boronyuk kept on hitting them till one of the thieves rushed to the window, shouting, Help! The fascists are beating us! The thieves never forgot it and threatened Boronyuk many times afterward. You smell like a dead man already. We'll take you with us. But they never attacked him again. Soon afterward, Our cell also clashed with the bitches. We were out in the yard to stretch our legs and relieve ourselves while we were at it when a woman prison officer sent a trustee to chase some of us out of the latrine. His arrogance to the politicals outraged Volodya Gershuni, a high-strung, youngish man, recently sentenced. Volodya pulled the trustee up short and the trustee felled the lad with a blow. Previously, the 58s would simply have swallowed this But now Maxim, the Azerbaijani, who had killed the chairman of his Kolkots, threw a stone at the trustee, while Boronyuk laid one on his jaw. He slashed Boronyuk with his knife, the warder's assistants went around with knives, there was nothing unusual in this, and ran to the warders for protection, with Boronyuk chasing him. They quickly herded us all into the cell, and senior prison officers arrived to discover who was to blame and threaten us with additional sentences for gang fighting. The MVD man's heart always bleeds for his nearest and dearest, his trustees. Boronyuk's blood was up, and he stepped forward of his own accord. I beat those bastards, and I'll go on beating them as long as I live. The Godfather warned us that we counter-revolutionaries couldn't afford to put on airs, and that it would be safer for us to hold our tongues. At this, up jumped Volodya Gershuni. He was hardly more than a boy, a first-year university student when he was arrested, and not just a namesake, but the nephew of that Gershuni, who once commanded the SR terrorist squad. He screamed at the godfather, as shrill as a fighting cock. Don't dare call us counter-revolutionaries! That's all in the past! We are revolutionaries again now, against the Soviet state this time. How we enjoyed ourselves, this was the day we'd lived for, and the godfather just frowned and scowled and swallowed it all. Nobody was taken off to the lock-up, and the prison officers beat an inglorious retreat. Was this how life in prison would be from now on? Could we then fight, turn on our tormentors, say out loud just what we thought? 
All that time we had endured it all like idiots. It's fun beating people who weep easily. We wept, so they beat us. Now, in the legendary new camps to which they were taking us, where men wore number patches as in the Nazi camps, but where there would at last be only political prisoners cleansed of the slimy criminal scum, perhaps the new life would begin. For Lord Yugershuni, with his dark eyes and his peaked, dead white face, said, hopefully, Once we get to the camp, we shall soon know with whom we belong. Silly lad, did he seriously expect to find there a vigorous political life with parties of many different shades feverishly contending, discussions, programs, underground meetings? With whom we belong, as though the choice had been left to us as though those who drew up the target figures for arrests in each republic and the bills of lading for camp transport trains had not decided it for us. In our very long cell, once a stable with two lines of two-tier bed platforms where the two rows of mangers used to stand, with pillars made of crooked tree trunks along the aisle propping up a decrepit roof, with typical stable windows in the long wall, shaped so that the hay could be forked straight into the mangers and made narrower by muzzles. In our cell there were 120 men of all sorts and conditions. More than half of them were from the Baltic states, uneducated people, simple peasants. The second purge was underway in that area and all who would not voluntarily join collective farms or who were suspected in advance of reluctance to join were being imprisoned or deported. Then there were quite a few Western Ukrainians, members of the OUN, Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, together with anyone who had once given them a night's rest or a meal. Then there were prisoners from the Russian Soviet Federation, with fewer new boys among them, most of them repeaters, and of course a certain number of foreigners. We were all being taken to the same camp complex. We found out from the records clerk that it was the Steplag group, I looked carefully at those with whom fate had brought me together and tried to see into their minds. I found the Estonians and Lithuanians particularly congenial. Although I was no better off than they were, they made me feel ashamed, as though I were the one who had put them inside. Unspoiled, hard-working, true to their word, unassuming. What had they done to be ground in the same mill as ourselves? They had harmed no one, lived a quiet, orderly life and a more moral life than ours. And now they were to blame because we were hungry, because they lived cheek by jowl with us and stood in our path to the sea. I am ashamed to be Russian, cried Herzen when we were choking the life out of Poland. I felt doubly ashamed in the presence of these inoffensive and defenseless people. My attitude to the Latvians was more complicated. There was a fatality in their plight, they had sown the seed themselves. And the Ukrainians? We have long ago stopped saying Ukrainian nationalists. We speak only of bandarists, and this has become such a dirty word that no one thinks of inquiring into the reality. We also call them bandits, following our established rule that anyone, anywhere, who kills for us is a partisan, whereas those who kill us are always bandits, beginning with the Tambov peasants in 1921. The reality is that although long ago in the Kiev period we and the Ukrainians constituted a single people, we have since then been torn asunder, and our lives, our customs, our languages for centuries past have taken widely different paths. The so-called reunion was a very awkward, though perhaps in some minds, a sincere attempt to restore our former brotherhood. But we have not made good use of the three centuries since. No statesman in Russia ever gave much thought to the problem of binding the Ukrainians and Russians together in kinship, of smoothing out the lumpy seam. Had the join been neater, the first Ukrainian committees would not have been formed in spring 1917, nor the Rada later on. The Bolsheviks, before they came to power, found the problem uncomplicated. In Pravda for June the 7th, 1917, Lenin wrote as follows. We regard the Ukraine and other regions not inhabited by great Russians as territories annexed by the Tsar and the capitalists. He wrote this when the Central Rada was already in existence. 
Then, on November the 2nd, 1917, the Declaration of the Rights of the Peoples of Russia was adopted. Was it just meant as a joke? Was it just a trick when they declared that the peoples of Russia did indeed have the right of self-determination up to and including secession? Six months later, the Soviet government requested the good offices of the Kaiser's Germany in helping Soviet Russia to conclude peace and define its boundaries with Ukraine. And Lenin signed a treaty to this effect with Hetzman and Skoropadsky on June the 14th, 1918. By doing so, he showed himself fully reconciled to the detachment of the Ukraine, even if it became a monarchy as a result. But strangely enough, as soon as the Germans were defeated by the Entente, which could not affect in the least the principles governing our relations with the Ukraine, as soon as the Hetman had fallen, together with his patrons, as soon as we proved stronger than Petliura, there's another word of abuse, Petliurovite, but these were merely Ukrainian townsfolk and peasants who wanted to order their lives without our interference. We immediately crossed the border which we had recognized and imposed our rule on our blood brothers. True, for 15 to 20 years afterward we made great play with the Ukrainian language, pushed it perhaps too hard, and impressed it on our brothers that they were completely independent and could break away whenever they pleased. Yet, when they tried to do so at the end of the war, we denounced them as banderists and started hunting them down, torturing them, executing them, or dispatching them to the camps. But banderists, like Petliurovites, are just Ukrainians who do not want to be ruled by others. Once they discovered that Hitler would not bring them the freedom they had been promised, they fought against the Germans, as well as ourselves, throughout the war. But we kept quiet about this, since like the Warsaw Rising of 1944, it shows us in an unfavorable light. Why are we so exasperated by Ukrainian nationalism, by the desire of our brothers to speak, educate their children, and write their shop signs in their own language? Even Mikhail Bulgakov, in the White Guard, let himself be misled on this subject. Given that we have not succeeded in fusing completely, that we are still different in some respects, and it is sufficient that they, the smaller nation, feel a difference. That however sad it may be, we have missed chance after chance, especially in the 30s and 40s, that the problem became most acute not under the Tsar, but after the Tsar. Why does their desire to secede annoy us so much? Can't we part with the Odessa beaches, or the fruit of Circassia? For me, this is a painful subject. Russia and the Ukraine are united in my blood, my heart, my thoughts. But from friendly contact with Ukrainians in the camps over a long period, I have learned how sore they feel. Our generation cannot avoid paying for the mistakes of generations before it. Nothing is easier than stamping your foot and shouting, That's mine! It is immeasurably harder to proclaim... You may live as you please. We cannot, in the latter end of the 20th century, live in the imaginary world in which our last, not very bright, emperor came to grief. Surprising though it may be, the prophecy of our vanguard doctrine that nationalism would fade has not come true. In the age of the atom and of cybernetics, it has for some reason blossomed afresh. Like it or not, the time is at hand when we must pay out on all our promissory notes guaranteeing self-determination and independence, pay up of our own accord, and not wait to be burned at the stake, drowned in rivers, or beheaded. We must prove our greatness as a nation not by the vastness of our territory, not by the number of peoples under our tutelage, but by the grandeur of our actions and by the depth of our tilth in the lands that remain when those who do not wish to live with us are gone. The Ukraine will be an extremely painful problem, but we must realize that the feelings of the whole people are now at white heat. Since the two peoples have not succeeded over the centuries in living harmoniously, it is up to us to show sense. We must leave the decision to the Ukrainians themselves. Let federalists and separatists try their persuasions. Not to give way would be foolhardy and cruel, and the gentler, the more tolerant, the more careful to explain ourselves we are now, 
the more hope there will be of restoring unity in the future. Let them live their own lives. Let them see how it works. They will soon find that not all problems are solved by secession. The fact that the ratio between those who consider themselves Russian and those who consider themselves Ukrainian varies from province to province of the Ukraine will cause many complications. A plebiscite in each province and afterward a helpful and considerate attitude to those who wish to move may be necessary. Not all of the Ukraine in its present official Soviet borders is really Ukrainian. Some of the left bank provinces undoubtedly feel drawn to Russia. For some reason, the cell in the converted stables was our home for a long time, and it looked as though they would never send us on to Steplag. Not that we were in any hurry, we enjoyed life where we were, and the next place could only be worse. We were not left without news, they brought us daily a sort of half-sized newspaper. I sometimes had the task of reading it aloud to the whole cell, and I read it with expression, for there were things there which demanded it. The tenth anniversary of the liberation of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania came around just at this time. Some of those who understood Russian translated for the rest. I paused for them to do so. And what can only be called a howl went up from the bed platforms as they heard about the freedom and prosperity introduced into their countries for the first time in history. Each of these bolts, and a good third of all those in the transit prison were bolts, had left behind a ruined home, and was lucky if his family was still there and not on its way to Siberia with another batch of prisoners. But what, of course, most excited the transit prison were the reports from Korea. Stalin's blitzkrieg had miscarried. The United Nations volunteers had by now been assembled. We saw in Korea the precursor, the Spain, of the Third World War, and Stalin probably intended it as a rehearsal. Those UN soldiers were a special inspiration to us. What a flag to fight under. Whom would it not unite? Here was a prototype of the united mankind of the future. We were wretched, and we could not rise above our wretchedness. Should this have been our dream, to perish so that those who looked unmoved on our destruction might survive? We could not accept it. No, we longed for the storm. Some would be surprised... What a desperate, what a cynical state of mind. Had you no thought for the hardships war would bring to those outside? Well, the free never spared us a thought. You mean, then, that you were capable of wishing for a world war? When all those people were given sentences in 1950 lasting till the mid-1970s, what hope were they left with except that of world war? I am appalled myself when I remember now the false and baneful hopes we cherished at the time. General nuclear destruction was no way out for anyone. And leaving aside the nuclear danger, a state of war only serves as an excuse for domestic tyranny and reinforces it. But my story will be distorted if I do not tell the truth about our feelings that summer. Romain Roland's generation in their youth were depressed by the constant expectation of war, but our generation of prisoners was depressed by its absence and not to say so would be to tell less than the truth about the spirit of the special political camps. This is what they had driven us to. World war might bring us either a speedier death, they might open fire from the watchtowers, poison our bread, or infect us with germs, German fashion. Or it just might bring freedom. In either case, deliverance would be much nearer than the end of a 25-year sentence. This was what Petya P. Blank V. counted on. Among those in our cell, Petya P. Blank V. was the last living soul to arrive from Europe. Immediately after the war, cells everywhere were packed with these Ruskies returning from Europe. But the first arrivals were long ago in camps or in the ground, and the rest had vowed to stay away. Where, then, had Petya sprung from? He had come home of his own free will in November 1949, when normal people were no longer returning. The war had overtaken him just outside Kharkov, where he attended an industrial school in which he had been compulsorily enrolled. Just as unceremoniously, the Germans carried these young lads off to Germany. There he remained as an Ostarbeiter to the end of the war, and there his philosophy of life was formed, 
A man must find an easy way of living, not work as he had been made to work from infancy. In the West, taking advantage of European credulity and lax frontier controls, he had smuggled French vehicles into Italy and Italian vehicles into France and sold them off cheaply. The French, however, had tracked him down and arrested him. He then wrote to the Soviet embassy saying that he wanted to return to his beloved fatherland. P. Blank B.'s reasoning was that in France he might get ten years, but would have to serve his sentence in full, whereas in the Soviet Union he would get twenty-five as a traitor, but then the first drops of the coming storm, the Third World War, were already falling. The Union, he thought, wouldn't last even three years, so it would pay him to go to a Soviet prison. Instant friends arrived from the embassy and clasped Petra P. Blank B. to their bosoms. The French authorities were glad to hand over a thief. French statistics are said to show that between the First and Second World Wars, the crime rate was lower among Russian emigres than among any other ethnic group. After the Second World War, the opposite was the case. Of all the ethnic groups, the Russians, Soviet citizens who had fetched up in France, had the highest crime rate. Some thirty others, just like Petya, were assembled in the embassy. They were given a comfortable sea passage to Murmansk, let loose to wander freely about the town, and picked up again one by one in the course of the next twenty-four hours. For his cellmates, Petya now took the place of Western newspapers. He had followed the Kravchenko trial in detail. Western theatre, he skillfully performed Western tunes with his cheeks and lips, and Western films. He told us the stories and mimed the action. How free and easy things were in the Quibyshev transit prison. The inmates of different cells occasionally met in the common yard. From under the muzzles we could exchange remarks with other transports as they were driven across the yard. On our way to the latrine we could approach the open windows, which were barred but unscreened, of the family barracks, where women with several children were held. They, too, were on their way into exile from the Baltic states and the western Ukraine. And between the two converted stables there was a crack, known as the telephone, where interested persons lay on either side of the wall discussing the news from morning to night. All these freedoms excited us still more. We felt the ground firmer under our own feet and imagined that it was becoming uncomfortably warm under the feet of our jailers. When we walked about the yard, we raised our faces to the sun-bleached July sky. We should not have been surprised, and not at all alarmed, if a V formation of foreign bombers had emerged from nowhere. Life, as it was, meant nothing to us. Prisoners travelling in the other direction from the Carabas transit prison brought rumours of notices stuck on walls. We won't take any more. We worked ourselves up to white heat and one sultry night in Omsk when we were being crammed and screwed into a prison van like lumps of sweating, steaming meat through a mincer. We yelled out of the depths at our warders. Just wait, you vermin! Truman will see you off. They'll drop the atom bomb on your heads. And the cowards said nothing. They were uneasily aware that our resistance was growing stronger and so we sensed that justice was more and more clearly on our side. We were so sick with longing for justice that we should not have minded if we and our tormentors were incinerated by the same bomb. We were in that final stage at which there is nothing to lose. If this is not brought into the open, the full story of the archipelago in the fifties will not have been told. The prison at Omsk, which had known Dostoevsky, was not like any old gulag transit prison hastily knocked together from matchwood. It was a formidable jail from the time of Catherine the Second, and its dungeons were particularly terrible. You could never imagine a better film set than one of its underground cells, the small square windows at the top of an oblique shaft up to ground level. The depth of this opening, three meters, tells you what the walls are like. The cell has no ceiling, but massive, menacing vaults converge overhead. One wall is wet. Water seeps through from the soil and leaks onto the floor. In the morning and in the evening it is dark, on the brightest afternoon, half dark. There are no rats, but you fancy that you can smell them. Although the vaulted roof dips so low that you can touch it in places, 
The jailers have contrived to erect two tier bed platforms even here, with the lower level barely raised above the floor, ankle high. You might think that this jail would stifle the vague, mutinous anticipations which had grown in us in the slack Quibbyshef transit prison. But no. In the evening, by the light of a 15-watt bulb, no brighter than a candle, Drozdov, the bald, sharp-featured church warden of the Cathedral Church at Odessa, takes his stand near the mouth of the window shaft, and in a voice that is weak yet full of feeling, the voice of a man whose life is ending, sings an old revolutionary song. Black as the conscience of tyrant or traitor, the shades of the autumn night fall. Blacker than night, looming out of the darkness, ghost-like, the grim prison wall. He sings only for us, but in this place if you shout it aloud, no one would hear. As he sings, his prominent Adam's apple runs up and down under the withered brown skin of his neck. He sings and shudders, he remembers, lets decades of Russian life flow through him, and we shudder in sympathy. Though all silent within, it's a jail, not a graveyard. Sentry, ah, sentry, beware. A song like that in a prison like that. It is a great pity that Shostakovich did not hear this song in that place. Either he wouldn't have touched it, or he would have expressed its modern instead of its dead significance. Not a false note, not a false word. Every note, every word in tune with what awaited our generation of prisoners. Then we settle down to sleep in the yellow gloom, the cold, the damp. Right, who's going to tell us a story? A voice is heard, that of Ivan Alexeyevich Spassky, a sort of composite voice of all Dostoevsky's heroes, a voice that falters, chokes, is never calm, seems about to break at any moment into weeping or a cry of pain. The most primitive tale by Breshko Breshkovsky, the Red Madonna, for instance, retold in such a voice, charged with faith, with suffering, with hatred, sounds like the Chanson de Roland. Whether it is true or pure fiction, the story of Victor Voronin, of how he raced 150 kilometers on foot to Toledo, and how the siege of Alcazar was raised, etches itself on our memories like an epic. Spassky's own life would make a better novel than many. In his youth, he took part in the campaign on the ice. He fought throughout the Civil War. He emigrated to Italy. He graduated from a Russian ballet school abroad, Karsavina's, I think, and also learned cabinet-making in the household of some Russian countess. Later on in the camps, he amazed us by making himself some miniature tools and fashioning for the bosses furniture of such exquisite workmanship with such elegantly curving lines that they were left speechless. True, it took him a month to make a little table. He toured Europe with the ballet. He was a news cameraman for an Italian company during the Spanish Civil War. Under the slightly disguised name of Giovanni Pasci, he became a major commanding a battalion in the Italian army and in summer 1942 arrived back on the Don. His battalion was promptly surrounded, though the Russians were still retreating almost everywhere. Left to himself, Spassky would have fought to the death, but the Italians, mere boys, started weeping. They wanted to live. After some hesitation, Major Pasci hung out the white flag. He could have committed suicide, but by now he was itching to take a look at some Soviet Russians. He might have gone through an ordinary prisoner of war camp and been back in Italy within four years, but his Russian soul was impatient of restraint, and he got into conversation with the officers who had captured him. A fatal mistake. If you are unlucky enough to be Russian, conceal the fact like a shameful disease, or it will go hard with you. First they kept him for a year in the Lubyanka, then for three years in the international camp at Kharkov. There was such a place full of Spaniards, Italians, Japanese... Then, without taking into account the four years he had already served, they doled out another twenty-five. Twenty-five! What a hope! He was doomed to a speedy end in Katorga. The jails at Omsk and then at Pavlodar took us in because, and this was a serious oversight, there was no specialized transit prison in either city. Indeed, in Pavlodar, what a disgrace! 
There wasn't even a prison van, and they marched us briskly from the station to the jail, many blocks away, without worrying about the local population, just like before the revolution, or in the first decade after. In the parts of town we went through, there were still neither pavements nor piped water, and the little one-story houses were sinking into the grey sand. The city proper began with the two-story white stone jail. But by 20th century standards, this was a jail to soothe rather than horrify, to inspire laughter rather than terror. A spacious, peaceful yard with wretched grass growing here and there, divided by reassuringly low fences into little squares for exercise. There were widely spaced bars across the cell windows on the second floor and no muzzles so that you could stand on the windowsill and examine the neighborhood. Directly below, under your feet, between the wall of the building and the outer prison wall, an enormous dog would run across the yard, dragging his chain when something disturbed him, and give a couple of gruff barks. But he too was not a bit like a prison dog, not a terrifying German shepherd trained to attack people, but a shaggy, yellow-white mongrel. They breed dogs like that in Kazakhstan, and already pretty old by the look of him. He was like one of those good-natured elderly wardens transferred to the camps from the army who thought prison service a dog's life and did not care who knew it. Beyond the prison wall we could see a street, a beer stall, and people walking or standing there, people who had come to hand in parcels for the prisoners and were waiting to get their boxes and wrapping paper back. Farther on there were blocks and blocks of one-story houses, the great bend of the Irtish, and open country vanishing beyond the river into the distance. A lively girl who had just got back from the guardhouse with her empty basket looked up and saw us waving to her from the window, but pretended not to notice. She walked unhurriedly, demurely past the beer stall, until she could not be seen from the guardhouse, and there her whole manner changed abruptly. She dropped the basket, frantically waved both arms in the air, and smiled at us. Then she signalled with nimble fingers, Write notes. Then an elliptical sweep of the arm, Throw them to me, throw them to me. Then, pointing in the direction of the town, I'll take them and pass them on for you. Then she opened both her arms wide. What else do you need? What can I do for you? I'm a friend. Her behaviour was so natural and straightforward, so unlike that of the harassed and hag-ridden free population, our bullied and baffled free citizens. What could it mean? Were times changing? Or was this just Kazakhstan, where half the population, remember, were exiles? Sweet, fearless girl, how quickly and accurately you had learned the prison gate skills, how happy it made me, and I felt a tear in my eye, to know that there are still people like you. Accept our homage, whoever you are. If our people had all been like you, there would have been not a hope in hell of imprisoning them. The infamous machine would have jammed. We had, of course, bits of pencil lead in our jackets and scraps of paper, and it would have been easy to pick off a lump of plaster, tie a note to it with thread, and throw it clear of the wall but there was absolutely nothing we could ask her to do for us in Pablo Dar, so we simply bowed to her and waved our greetings. We were driven into the desert. Even the unprepossessing, overgrown village of Pablo Dar we should soon remember as a glittering metropolis. We were now taken over by an escort party from Steplag, but not, fortunately, from the Jezkazgan camp division. Throughout the journey we had kept our fingers crossed that we would not end up in the copper mines. The trucks sent to collectors had built up sides and grills were attached to the rear of their cabs to protect the Tommy gunners from us as though we were wild animals. They packed us in tightly, facing backward, with our legs twisted under us, and in this position jogged and jolted us over the potholes for eight hours on end. The Tommy gunners sat on the roof of the cab, with the muzzles of their guns trained on our backs throughout the journey. Up front rode lieutenants and sergeants, and in the cab of our truck there was an officer's wife with a little girl of six. When we stopped, the little girl would jump down and run through the grass picking flowers and calling in a clear voice to her mother. She was not in the least put out by the tommy guns, the dogs, 
the ugly shaven heads of the prisoners sticking up over the sides of the lorries. Our strange world cast no shadow on the meadows and the flowers, and she didn't even spare us a curious glance. I remembered the son of a sergeant major at the special prison in Zagorsk. His favorite game was making two other little boys, the sons of neighbors, clasp their hands behind their backs. Sometimes he tied their hands and walk along the road while he walked alongside with a stick, escorting them. As the fathers live, so the children play. We crossed the Irtish. We rode for a long time through water meadows, then over dead, flat step. The breath of the Irtish, the freshness of evening on the step. The scent of wormwood enveloped us whenever we stopped for a few minutes, and the swirling clouds of light grey dust raised by the wheels sank to the ground. Thickly powdered with this dusk, we looked at the road behind us. We were not allowed to turn our heads. Kept silent, we were not allowed to talk. And thought about our destiny, the camp with the strange, difficult, un-Russian name. We had read the name on our case files, hanging upside down from the top shelf in the stolypin, Ekivashtuts. But nobody could imagine where it was on the map, and only Lieutenant Colonel Oleg Ivanov remembered that it was a coal mining area, we even supposed that it might be somewhere quite close to the Chinese border, and this made some of us happy, since they had yet to learn that China was even worse than our own country. Captain Second Class Burkovsky, a new boy and a twenty-fiver, he still looked askance at us because he was a communist imprisoned in error while all around were enemies of the people. He acknowledged me only because I was a former Soviet officer and had not been a prisoner of war. Reminded me of something I had learned at the university and forgotten. If we traced a meridian line on the ground at the autumnal equinox and subtracted the meridional altitude of the sun on September the 23rd from 90, we should find our latitude. This was reassuring, although there was no way of discovering our longitude. On and on they drove. Darkness fell. The stars were big in the black sky and we saw clearly now that we were being carried south-southwest. Dust danced in the beams of headlights behind us. Patches of the dust cloud whipped up over the whole road, but were visible only where the headlights picked them up. A strange mirage rose before me. The world was a heaving sea of blackness, except for those whirling, luminous particles forming sinister pictures of things to come. To what far corner of the earth, what God-forsaken hole, were they taking us? Where were we fated to make our revolution? Our legs, doubled under us, became so numb that they might not have been ours. It was very near midnight when we reached a camp surrounded by a high wooden fence and out in the dark steppe beside a dark sleeping settlement, bright with electric light in the guardhouse and around the boundary fence. After another roll call with full particulars, March 1975, they led us through the towering double gates for what was left of our quarter century. The camp was asleep, but all the windows of all the huts were brightly lit, as though the tide of life was running high. Lights on at night, that meant prison rules. The doors of the huts were fastened from outside by heavy padlocks. Bars stood out black against the brightly lit rectangles of the windows. The orderly who came out to meet us had number patches stuck all over him. You've read in the newspapers that in Nazi camps, people had numbers sewn on their clothes, haven't you?